Elvis Presley with 1964's Viva Las Vegas. Now, for many fans, Elvis and Las Vegas have been synonymous for years, but that wasn't always the case. And in their own ways, both Elvis and Las Vegas were taking a huge gamble, pun intended, in 1969 when Elvis set up a residency at the newly opened International Hotel. Well, as we now know, 50 years later, that gamble paid off, and the results can be heard in a new 11-disc box set collecting those performances. And the story behind those performances is chronicled in a new book, by returning guest Richard Zoglin. The book is called Elvis in Vegas. Richard, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Great to be with you. <laughs> well, it's it's great to have you back. And even though Elvis Presley's triumphant 1969 Las Vegas shows are celebrated in your new book, and certainly anyone who's interested in that period of Elvis's life is going to have a lot to explore, the great thing about your book is that you provide the context. So in other words, one doesn't have to be an all-out Elvis fan to enjoy this because you not only get Elvis's story, but you get the whole history of Las Vegas and the period leading up to uh, Elvis. Yeah, I actually, it, it the origin of the book was I wanted to write a book about uh, Las Vegas's golden age of entertainment, sort of the heyday years of the 60s, right. from the Rat Pack to Elvis. And Elvis kind of took over the book uh, a little bit and, and provided a great framework for it. But I really wanted to tell two stories, the story of Elvis and, and in Vegas and the story of Vegas in those golden years and how, how Elvis kind of changed Vegas when he uh, made his great comeback show in 69. Now, Hardcore Elvis fans will know this, but I don't think the average uh, music listener knows that Elvis played Las Vegas very early in his career, in, in 1956, and far from being the uh, big success he later became, he was uh, kind of kind of a flop. He, he was not successful. He was just coming up. Uh, he was uh, had one hit at, at that point, Heartbreak Hotel, was just starting to break out, and people were starting to know who he was, but he hadn't even been on the Ed Sullivan show yet. And Colonel Parker, his manager, booked him into the New Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas on a bill with Freddie Martin's orchestra and Shecky Green. Uh, a pretty odd combination for <laughs> Las Vegas in 1956. And, you know, rock and roll was still very new. Uh, Elvis was just an, you know, this hip-shaking kid from Memphis and the sort of uh, sedate nightclub crowd in Las Vegas didn't know what to make of him. So he was not uh, very successful. Thank you very much, friends. Here's one more little song. Like but he loved Vegas. He uh, kept coming back there for... Uh, is just for R and R after his movie shoots and stuff, and he had a long relationship with Vegas well before his uh, comeback show in '69. So let's fast forward to 1969. Elvis needs a place to make his live comeback, and Las Vegas needs someone like Elvis. You show in the book that at the beginning of the '60s, Las Vegas, with the Rat Pack and that entire high roller culture, was the hippest place to be. And then by the end of the decade, uh, it was all starting to feel like old hat. So Las Vegas was primed for a big change. Yeah. Well, you know, the cult, the whole culture went through changes in the 60s and the music world. Uh, the Beatles happened, all the, the sort of next rock revolution with all the big bands of the, of the late 60s and the counterculture and uh, everything that was happening Suddenly, Vegas Vegas was not getting uh, rock and roll bands very much. A few R and B, a little bit of rock would might play in the lounges, but you know the Beatles didn't uh, play Las right. Vegas. Although they did play Las Vegas in their first U.S. tour for one night, uh, but they would never do a showroom show. You know the Rolling Stones were Bob Dylan wasn't going to Las Vegas. The big shows were not uh, they were not rock and roll. And uh, the, the rock groups didn't want to come to Las Vegas, and the, uh, the kids, you know, the younger generation, uh, weren't coming to Las Vegas. They were going to, to arena shows. So Vegas was starting to worry about what its future was, and there was something kind of neat about how <laughs> they, they ended up going to the original rock and roller and making him a huge Vegas star. It's worth noting, and you point out in the book, that it was really up to Elvis to put together his own show. I mean, that was his vision. 
Yeah, you know, it, it, think about it. He did not do any live performing virtually through the entire 1960s. When he came back from the Army in 1960, the colonel decided no more concerts. He was just going to do movies and recordings. And he did a couple of benefit concerts in 1961, but that was it. So he, he was off the radar in terms of rock and roll and music in the 60s and considered kind of over the hill. Um, he made a comeback in his big uh, NBC comeback special in December 1968, which was a big hit in the ratings and with the critics, and that you know reminded people that Elvis was still an incredible performer uh, and could still do rock and roll. Then that's when the colonel decided, well, now it's time for a comeback to live performing, and he would do it in Las Vegas at the brand-new International Hotel. But Elvis, you know, I was surprised that he didn't have much uh, help in terms of putting together that show, just his friends. I mean, he didn't have a director or a producer or, or just a, even an old, you know, Vegas hand to sort of give him some pointers on how to put together a Vegas show. He did it himself. He just put together a set. He, he assembled a new band, backup band, starting with James Burton on lead guitar. He chose the songs in consultation with the band and, um, and put together a, a show that was really unlike anything Vegas had seen before. It was not a, a traditional Vegas uh, intimate nightclub, you know, Rat Pack style show. It was a big rock concert extravaganza. It was in a showroom that was twice as large as any other in Las Vegas. And, um, and it had rock and roll in it. It had other things, too. He was doing a whole range of music and a lot of new stuff that he was just recording. But um, it was uh, something Vegas hadn't seen before. Crazy. That was Elvis Presley live at the International Hotel for the Midnight Show, August 26th, 1969, as heard on the new box set, Elvis Live 1969. Richard Zoglin joins us. His new book is called Elvis in Vegas. You know, I have heard over the years from rock and roll fans that, boy, you know, if Elvis had just come out and done uh, something like the Sun Sessions on stage or something really stripped down, that would have been his true soul. But he was sort of forced to do these songs like Words by the Bee Gees or You've Lost That Love and Feeling. And that really wasn't what Elvis was all about. But I've got news for you, and it's backed up in the book. That is what Elvis was about. That's the material he chose to do. He wanted to do those songs. Yeah. He, uh, he would do the old uh, rock and roll songs from the 50s, and he, but he wanted to get to the new stuff. He, he, had a, he had a big voice, and he wanted to show it off in every way possible. Uh, he was doing new. He had just recorded a bunch of uh, very important songs for him, Suspicious Minds, which he introduced right. in Las Vegas, and which uh, it was released in Las Vegas and, and went on to be his first number one hit in seven years. Other big songs like uh, Kentucky Rain, and, um, and, and then he was doing covers of, yeah, songs like You've Lost uh, That Love and Feeling or, or um, Beatles, The Beatles Yesterday or something. And uh, he, he showed he could do everything. And I don't think he cared that he wasn't like the cutting edge of rock and roll anymore. He was doing big ballads and sometimes sentimental stuff, songs like Memories, and uh, you know, I think he was thought of maybe as a little corny, but we, even that, but that first show, that '69 show, even the hip rock critics, all the rock critics, knew you know were wowed by him because he he was just so dynamic on stage. He was rocking like he, as as hard as he ever did, and he was showing off that big voice in all sorts of uh, songs. And I, I think everybody was impressed, and I think he was great. I don't think he was ever better on stage than he was in 69 in Las Vegas and for the first uh, year or so after that. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Elvis Presley's triumphant comeback shows at the International Hotel in Las Vegas with author Richard Zoglin, his new book, Elvis in Vegas, a wonderful new book. And there was something else about Elvis that might have been unusual for the city. Elvis was not a finger-snapping, man-about-town, 
with all of that, you know, bluster that <laughs> we associate with Vegas acts, he was this modest guy, which is kind of hard to believe when you look at what he wore on stage. But, you know, he was kind of low key and very respectful of other performers. And he ingratiated himself with, uh, you know, maybe people that otherwise wouldn't have given him the time of day. Well, yeah, he was. He was he was kind of on stage. He was when he sang, he was great. When he was talking to the audience, he was kind of awkward and nervous and uh, very self-deprecating. In person, you know, people liked Elvis. Elvis, he, he did have those old Southern manners. He was very gracious with people. He was generous with friends and, and giving away things all the time. Uh, I, I do think he was modest. He was interested in people. He listened. He was a reader. Uh, I think, you know, he was genuinely liked. Yes, some things, as as the career went on and he got crazier and and the the drug use increased and the shows got more bombastic, but Elvis himself, I think, stayed surprisingly down to earth. He kept away from the mob, which was still kind of in, in Vegas in the 60s. Yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah, I think that was, credit the colonel with that, because yeah. he, he wanted to make sure Elvis had a kind of clean, all-American boy sort of image. Your book really does focus on those shows of 1969, a little bit into 1970, but you really don't go into detail on Elvis's decline. And some would say, well, gee, that would be the, the heart-wrenching, juicy uh, aspect of Elvis's story. Well, first of all, I think that story has been told a lot. And, uh, and it's been sensationalized quite a bit and moralized over. And I, I just felt I wanted people to remember the great Elvis and how, how much he did for Las Vegas, how much Vegas did for him and how much he did for Las Vegas, because I think he took Vegas in a new direction. And, yes, he kind of went downhill, and the shows got, you know, over the top and silly, and he, I think he got lazier on stage as he got bored with, with it and uh, but I, I kind of I, I I go through that story um, I mean I, I tell the story fairly quickly but I just think that, um, that his, his achievement in Las Vegas deserves recognition especially since we're now on the 50th anniversary this month of um, of, of that 69 comeback show and I just reminded want to remind people of the great reinvention Elvis did of his own career in that Vegas show, and not the kind of sad story of what happened after. And of course, RCA uh, or BMG or whoever owns it now is also doing their own celebrating. They they have this box set at now right. of, of eleven shows. And you mentioned that you know Elvis needed Vegas as a as a place to make that comeback, and Vegas definitely needed Elvis to reinvent itself. And boy. That reinvention continues to this day because without Elvis being the first to really do it, you would not have the residencies right. that big pop music stars are doing today. Yeah, I think uh, one thing Elvis did was, uh, first of all, he made the Vegas show an event. He would come back twice a year for four-week engagements, and people started to plan their trips to Vegas around Elvis. And they didn't do that in the old days. You know, right. you'd come to Vegas and you'd just book your shows, whoever was there. Uh, if it was Frank Sinatra, you'd see him. If he wasn't there, you'd see Sammy Davis Jr., whatever. But uh, Elvis made the show an event, and he also brought in a new kind of audience, a more, much broader uh, middle American audience, people who some, who, he, they weren't Vegas, necessarily Vegas gamblers. They were just people who loved Elvis and uh, uh, maybe a, a more family crowd. And th- that was the audience that Vegas was kind of moving toward. It took them a couple of decades <laughs> more. Uh, but th- then the, the, the kind of new reinvention of Las Vegas with um, the theme park hotels, the Cirque du Soleil shows, and now the new residencies, which starting with Celine Dion in the early 2000s, and now you can see you know, kind of a lot of rock performers, Lady Gaga and Aerosmith, and who are are playing Vegas. You know, I think that Elvis was really the first, uh, sort of the sound of the starting gun for that that those kind of performances. And you know, think about it. Back in uh, the late '60s, 
Nobody knew that rock and rollers, nobody knew what happened to rock and rollers after age 30. Right. Elvis was 34 when he went into Vegas in 69. And it was a new phenomenon of, of rock and rollers over 30 continuing their career. So right. Elvis kind of showed that that was still possible. Now, of course, they can keep going into their 70s. But back then, who knew? <laughs> right, right. So uh, this might seem like a silly question because I bet people have probably seen this book in their local bookstores. But where would, uh, where would be the best place to get your book these days? Oh, gosh. Um, any bookstore, Barnes and Noble, uh, Amazon, of course, carries it, and uh, online other online sellers. Um, I think it's just about all over the place. And I'm glad you mentioned also the um, the new box set of uh, CDs, eleven CDs. It's actually Sony now is the one who, well, that's who owns uh, um, RCA. But all those old sh- all the shows, every sh- uh, virtually every show that was recorded in '69, you can hear. So. Great stuff. And where can people catch up with you uh, online if they want to see what you're up to? Uh, my website is richardzoglin.com, uh, and uh, I'm on Twitter at, at, at rzoglin, and um, Instagram, too, at the same. <laughs> um, my Facebook account, too. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Richard. You have a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. 